All right, just a uh, uh, few quick formalities. Who am I? Oracle Waze, 12, 12 years in the Oracle field, working for PTN. Um, I am in the consulting group, so I deal with special projects, performance tuning, critical services. Um, who is PTN and why are they sponsoring this? Um, PTN provides uh, services to companies that depend on data. That's pretty much the short. Okay. So, um, quick notes on the agenda. So, we're going to cover types of physical memory, virtual memory, types of memory. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of foundation for, uh, for, in order to understand some of the metrics we're going to talk about. And we're going to mention some Oracle specifics and huge pages. And at the end, there is something very exciting that I recently uncovered. Um, and it's coming in the newer kernels, Linux kernels. All right, types of memory. So it's, it's all memory. Uh, when, whether we talk about CPU registers, CPU caches, main memory, or RAM, or simply memory that we refer to, or SSD caches, or disk, or even tapes, it's all memory. The only difference between all these um, different memories that we call with different names is performance. They have very different performance characteristics. And when we talk about performance characteristics, we talk about two things, latency and bandwidth. Well, cost as well is a, is a factor. Uh, because it, do, it doesn't matter how infinitely fast something is, if the cost is infinitely high, then we don't call it a performance thing. So here, here's how the memory hierarchy is uh, on an abstract level. At the very top, the very fastest memory we have today are the CPU registers, which is, which is the building blocks for what the CPU uses to perform computations. And everything under that is just builds on that. So you have the level one, level two, level three caches, maybe level four someday. We have RAM, SSD, disk, and this is all sorted by performance. <laughs> but this is not an accurate graph uh, because uh, these different layers have very different performance characteristics and in different sizes. Here I put some of the, the sizes and the uh, performances for, for all these layers and you can see the link at the bottom if you want to learn more. Um, and it, it's interesting, this is, you know, I, I gave this a, a pretty good boost. I, I gave it three milliseconds response time and we all know that this is on the high end part. Um, so, if, in order to grasp how different these numbers are, if we consider your CPU registers to be your hands and that you need to pick up an object before you can manipulate it, you be in the CPU, then CPU cache is, it would be a three seconds time frame thing, which is like finding something on your desk. Um, level three cache will be uh, 12 seconds, which is looking through your uh, drawers in your desk, and in the case of, of NUMA, uh, 48 uh, seconds is if someone else is accessing your, your desk um, drawers. RAM in this aspect would be 60 seconds, so I imagine you want to you wanna take a sip of your coffee and your coffee is in, happens to be in RAM and not in your hands, so well, here we go, 60 seconds. And if I stop for 60 seconds, things will get very awkward very quickly. And in, in this concept, SSD is 16 hours, so two, uh, almost two full working days. And, and disk is 34 days, so one month. So if, if your coffee happens to be on disk, you're gonna drink it in October. So, so to draw this more accurately, um, th this is how it looks like. So um, vertically is the um, the size and horizontally, sorry, horizontally is the latency and vertically, um, I'm sorry, vertically is the latency, horizontally is the size, okay? So you can see the CPU registers are, is this very small tip at the very top, but it's also very, very short because the latency is very small. And everything after that has a bigger, bigger latency. But I, I want to bring this to your attention here, the, the, the little graph here. Notice the, the difference between every layer it in X factor. So the difference between CPU registers and level one cache is 4X in latency. Level two cache to level one cache, 2.5X. Uh, level two to level three, 4X. And then the moment you get to RAM, um, uh, underneath that is, is the, the difference in size. So level one cache 
to uh, CPU registers to level one cache is 512 times larger, right? Uh, it gets interesting when you when you reach RAM, because when you're going to RAM, the size difference between the previous layer, which is you typically level three cache, is 22,000 times. Yet the, the penalty for latency is only 5x. So RAM RAM is the first dramatic step that increases the amount of memory you have without drastically increasing your cost to access this memory. So that's why it's very important how to manage it. And now once we go out of, of RAM, notice that SSDs and disks, um, I put disks as infinitely um, size, and SSDs I put to four terabytes, just, just to compare. I mean, obviously it's going to grow. Notice that uh, the difference in latency jumps very quickly the moment you leave RAM. So once you leave RAM, latency jumps a thousand times. Well, so far it was, you know, between four to five X, between every layer. Here outlines every step. So RAM is your most important cache. So thus we needed to come up with a good way to manage it. And here comes virtual memory. And just, just to recap how a computer works, it's very basic, but it's important to put it in your mind when you, when you think about things. So computers read instructions from memory and basically execute them. And the, the input and output is, happens to be in some form of memory. At the end, you can display it on screen, which is, again, a different type of output, or you can you know, print it, or sound can come out, but it, it all goes in and out of memory. So uh, we use the computer to do things, basically run multiple things at the same time. We, we expect them to be unaware of, of whatever it is that we run. Right? We, want, we want to run queries at the same time. Uh, we want to run updates, modifications, backups. We want everything to happen at the same time without any chance of interfering with each other. So this is where virtual memory really comes in handy. Virtual memory attempts to abstract the read-write concept between the different layers and particularly between the RAM layer and the disk layer, and to just work with memory. So virtual memory introduced um, security uh, for the application. So basically, one application cannot interfere with another application's uh, memory. Um, it, one of its goals was to simplify memory management. So that's why you have <coughs> some advanced features such as memory mapped files, which is instead of reading and writing, basically, Instead of you manually having to say, move this piece of data from this memory medium to this other media, uh, memory medium so that I can do something with it, you would simply access the memory medium, which will do this for you behind the scenes. And th there was all kinds of, the, the file system cache is basically an acceleration behind the scenes for um, keeping some of your workload in a faster memory. So here, here is now, we're moving to the techie part, um, virtual memory. So basically every process has um, a virtual view of, of addressing space, which is completely independent from other processes. And some, some of this addressing space is filled up with libraries, some of it is filled up with data. And there are all regions marked specifically for data, for execution, for libraries, and etc. Now this takes some amount of memory to manage, so here we have for, to map this, to manage these 27 gig gigabytes of virtual space, there is a mapping table which takes four gigabytes, uh, sorry, four megabytes. And it's outside of the virtual space for the process. And this is an extract from top which basically allows you to do, to make some sense of the mappings. The important aspect is, is, the, is the different areas. So the libraries, they're copied from disk, they're loaded from disk, which means they're copied from one memory medium to another. While the SGA and the data portions, they're not copied from anywhere. They're, they're basically c computed via, via a formula, via code. So they don't have any other representation in, in memory. The, the thing that is copied from disk has another copy, another representation in a different memory medium that is slower. So essentially, in this case, it is used as a cache, while the other section is used as a, as a store. 
So from this, we, we define two types of memories that are very important to understand. With a disk representation and without a disk representation. And on some OSs, this is called anonymous or computed memory for, for the ones without a disk representation. On Linux, it's called anonymous. So let's move on. Now, if you have two processes, at some point you want to share some data. You want, given that the RAM is very important, you want to share it as much as possible. So everything that's copied from an, another medium obviously exists in the other medium, and another process could easily access that same medium. So that's why you want to share this part. So everything that is copied from disk is shared. Everything that is not copied from disk by default is not shared. There are specific APIs that can make it shared such as the Oracle SGA, it's called Shared Memory Segments. So shared everything from disk and shared memory segments, private, anonymous memory, copy and write memory, some advanced features of VMs. So where can we see all this? Um, just a quick show of hands, please. How many of you use Linux today? How many of you do not use Linux today? OK. Well, so in Linux, you can do, you can cat slash proc slash meminfo to get a information on how your memory is used. However, these values are not additive. You cannot add these values and come up with your total value. They all have different slices, different views of your data. So in this aspect, cached is everything that's copied from disk, which includes all the binaries that are currently being executed and run, includes the file system cache and a few other things. A non-pages is everything that is not from disk, anything that is computed and defined and is, its source is programmatic as opposed to copied from another memory medium. And page tables is um, the memory required to manage your, your virtual mappings. So in the Oracle aspect, the SGA is shared anonymous the binaries, the Oracle binary, the libraries, is shared from disk. And the um, private is um, anonymous data, basically. Stacks, um, PGA memory for every process, and etc. And you can see that SGA is reported in the cache section. So in the same section that your file system cache is reported is where the SGA is reported. So in this case, it says 38 gigabytes of, of cached. So this is file system cache binaries and Oracle SGA. So this can be very confusing because the SGA doesn't come from disk, yet it's reported as cached. Now, if you use huge pages, this is the same system with huge pages. Um, the, 20, the 28 gigabyte, 27 gigabyte SGA now is no longer accounted in cached and it's accounted in a different section. And I'll come back to this. So it's very important to define this and to understand it. So Oracle SGA is in cache section when without huge pages and not in the cache section with huge pages. Here's a table of all the memory mappings. So everything pool is SGA, so um, Oracle location, SGA, OS location, cached. Sorting, hashing, Oracle location, PGA, OS location, anonymous pages. So we talk about huge pages. So what is huge pages? Huge pages is a separate memory pool, independent of, of the regular memory pool, that you can use for shared memory segments. Now in your kernels, this with um, uh, transparent huge pages, it's called. Other um, non-shared memory segments can leverage this feature, but we're not going to cover this. Huge pages are non-swappable, locked in memory, and they're not part of, and they're not managed by the VM. Basically, whenever the VM is looking to free up memory, shift memory around, it doesn't consider huge pages at all. So it reduces the amount of memory the VM has to deal with. Here is a visual representation. So imagine 60, 72 gigabytes of RAM. Without huge pages, everything is managed in 4K chunks. If you define a 48 gigabyte huge page pool, then some of these 
four Ks will be merged together into to form a two megabyte block, and this will be your huge pages. So some um, we're going to come back to huge pages a bit later again. Some tricks that um, uh, can make accounting memory difficult. Untouched memory does not exist. So if I have an application and I say, give me a gig of RAM, I'm going to say, OK, fine. But you wouldn't see this gig of RAM taken from anywhere but one location that you probably never look at. Because it's so huge that it's almost unbelievable. They also don't take page table entries, so they don't consume space uh, for management. So here's an example. Here's a very simple program, a three-line C program that all it does is allocates a gig of RAM and sleeps for 60 seconds. Notice the free memory. When I run the program, the free memory drops by 100K, and that's to execute the program. The one gig that I requested doesn't exist, doesn't come out from free memory, but it does come out from committed. But if you looked at committed on your systems, you'll find some astronomical number, typically. And that's how much memory you would have needed should our applications touch the memory they've requested. So what does that mean for Oracle? It means that non-initialized SGA takes no memory. And this is very important to understand. So when you start up your database, if you have a 30 gig SGA, it won't, you won't take 30 gigs until you actually start consuming the memory. So if you fire up five databases, each taking 30 gig of SGA and you only have 30 gig of RAM, it'll be fine until you start initializing your memory. Also, untouched SGA by a new process does not consume page table entries. And this is very important, and you'll find out why in the next few slides. Other tricks that will make accounting your memory difficult. Memory can be both swapped and not swapped at the same time. And this is called swap cached. Now, only anonymous memory is swapped. The other memory is never swapped because it already has a disk representation. It, it already exists in a different store. Anonymous memory, RAM is the store, so it needs to be written to this before you can take it out of RAM. But Linux has this trick called swap cache, which is writing things to disk ahead of time so that if it needs to take it out of RAM for whatever reason, you wouldn't need to wait to write the disk. I wish parallel queries and sorting did the same, but they don't. So what this means is if you look at your cache use, uh, your swap usage and memory usage, they overlap, right? So you're going to have one gig in RAM and one gig in swap. So if you summarize memory consumed and swap used, you, you will double count some memory. Another important aspect of that is if you have swap usage, that doesn't mean your performance is suffering. Actual data in swap that is not in RAM and would have to be read back should it ever is accessed is swap total minus swap free minus swap cached. Overcommit. Linux can allocate memory that it doesn't that it cannot fulfill. So if I have 8 gigs of RAM and 8 gigs of swap, technically I can manage 16 gigs of RAM. However, Linux will let me allocate far more than that because it knows that developers are lazy and allocate memory that they never use. Now, what happens then when uh, Linux overpromised? Well, that's when the out of memory killer comes in handy and starts killing things for you. Solaris is different. I'll just mention that quickly. Solaris will not let you allocate memory that it cannot fulfill. So it doesn't have an out of memory killer. Also, Solaris will not let you have anonymous memory that, it, that does not have a swap reservation. So if you have one terabyte of RAM and you want to use one terabyte of memory, you have to have one terabyte of swap. Solaris won't let you do that without this, except when you use ISM. But so different thing. But it's important to understand this. So Solaris may report out of memory errors when you have plenty of memory simply because you don't have swap space. I'm going to skip that one. How many of you use Solaris for Oracle today? Just one person? Okay. 
So just a quick note, if you use ISM, then your anonymous SGA needs to have a swap does not need to have a swap reservation. If you use DISM, then you do need to have a swap representation. And whether you use ISM or DISM um, is determined by whether your SGA target, your SGA max size is bigger than your SGA target. All right, monitoring memory. So Linux memory tools to use to monitor memory. Proc meminfo, which I've already used once to show you some examples. VMstat, IPCS, and cgroups. This is the new one. It's very exciting. Per process, you can use top and you can use the slash proc file system. So uh, proc pid and then status and maps can give you information about the memory usage of a specific process. On Solaris, you can use PRStat to replace top. Um, PRStat also has some additional options to show you more details. VMStat, and unfortunately you need root and you need a debugger to get some information about how much file system cache is actually used and that's the command you need. PRStat example. All right, VMStat. Uh, on Solaris, there is no way to tell you if you're swapping or not. Uh, swap out, swap in is always zero, so don't get, don't fall into that trick. On Linux, swap out, swap in clearly indicate when you're reading and writing from swap space. Now, swapping out, typically you're not waiting for that. Swap in, you're definitely waiting for that. This is Solaris specific. IPCS. IPCS is a tool that you can run to tell you what are the shared memory segments that exist in your system. Now remember, shared memory segments can still be swapped to disk unless they're locked in memory. So even though you may have a shared memory, it can still be swapped out. If IPCS gives you um, segment keys and segment addresses, if you want to find out which segments are, should be mapped to your Oracle instance, you can use sysresv to find out. Here's an example of IPCS. It gives you the size, the owner, and number attached. SysResV gives you um, the Oracle, for, the, for a given Oracle set, it tells you what ID and key it's going to use. So you can map that out. So let's talk a little bit more about meminfo. Now every new kernel Every so often, new kernels will add more and more granularity for the memory accounting. So you may have more um, areas than what are listed in this slide. For example, S reclaimable and S unreclaimed was added at some point in the past. So what, let's talk a, bit, so, a little bit about some of the important ones. So memtoro is total memory available to Linux. It excludes some BIOS reserved regions. If it's not what you expect, then you may, may want to check um, if you have any bad DIMMs. It has happened. We've had clients when we say, how come this server has 64 gigs of RAM and this, server, this other server has 56? Oh, no, no, they both have 64. That's not what I'm saying. Oops, we have a bad DIMM. MEM3, this is wasted memory. This is memory that serves no purpose other than sit around. It is memory that is immediately available to be allocated to any process for any need, file system cache, uh, or um, any, any memory allocation that a process touches. Linux will try to use all of your free memory for file system cache. You can control how much free memory Oracle try, uh, sorry, Linux tries to keep by min free kilobytes. So um, here's an example where we have 26 megabytes free or out of memory, or are we? I say, hey Linux, try to keep 900 megs. Instantly I get 200 megs. No change to the workload running. Buffers, buffers is not the file system cache. Buffers is raw disk blocks. And the difference between buffers and cached is cached is associated with the file handle. Buffers are physical addresses on, on block devices. Usually XT3 metadata is in buffers. 
cache this memory that is copied from disk to RAM and includes shared memory segments if they don't use huge pages. It can be dirty, it, can, it may require to be written to disk. Here is an example. Meminfo freshly booted system 8 gigs of RAM. I have three files for a total of five gigs. I cat all the files to devno, meaning I read all the files. Here's what VM stat reports. BI is bytes in, which is measured in kilobytes. So I'm reading at 68, 73 megabytes per second. And this goes on for some time. Free memory goes down. I'm running out of memory, or am I? Cache is going up. Whenever the reading is finished, I have 5.4 in cache. And buffers is 16 megs. Here is a writing example with cached. Now I cat the same files that I just read, so they're fully cached, to a new file. So basically, I would, if this wasn't cached, I would read it and write it. Because it's cached, I read it from RAM and only write it. Now when I write it, it's also cached. So what happens is cached starts going down, bytes out initially doesn't do anything, but then starts writing. And free memory goes down all the way down to 16 megs. Whenever it's finished, I have 16 megs free and 8 gigs cached. Now here's a cool thing. Because memory, cached memory is associated with the file handle, when you remove the handle, the memory instantly comes back. So whenever you're low on memory on your database servers, just remove a few files. Committed. Committed is all the memory that applications have requested. So if every application running on the system was to use every memory that it has ever requested, this is how much RAM you would need. Go ahead and have a look how much, th what this value is on your systems. And you will realize the benefits of, of virtual memory. Here's an example, that same program. When you do commit it, Whenever I request a gig, committed changes. Slab. Um, this is a very important kernel memory area. It's basically the shared pool for the Linux kernel. It's called a slab allocator. It's basically system cache, uh, sorry, system space. Unfortunately, some caches are there, such as um, some inode caches, some directory listings caches are there. You can use slab top to get more details about every object in the slab allocator. And you can press C, I believe, to order by size, because the default is ordered by number of active objects. And notice here, ext 3 inode cache. This is a cache inside the kernel space. So basically, if your slabs are very large, it could be that it's, a lot of it is used for caching. We already discussed huge pages. Um, the interesting thing is that because they're two megabytes in size, they require 512 times less page table entries. Why is this important? Here's a, here's a very ex small example, a very old example that I should refresh at some point. It's on a 32-bit system, 1.7 gigs of SGA, very, very small. How many of you have um, valuable production systems that have less than two gigs in the SGA? None. Good. So even in such a small scale, there is a dramatic impact of huge pages. So here's the test case. 1.7 gig SGA, 1.4 in cache. I started 100 sessions and they have, all have to read a, a table in order for them to all initialize their page table entries. So here we go, before starting, the, uh, the database is up, before connecting the sessions, page tables, four megs. After the sessions have finished all touching the SGA, now page tables is 300 megabytes. So nothing changed in this system. The only thing that changed is every session read its, and initialized its SGA mappings. And that consumed 300 megs for, for one gig of 
cache. So page table enters are per process, non-shareable, except in Solaris ISM. And they, they're like an index, uh, like a B3 index. So you cannot say it's X bytes per entry, but it's at least 16 bytes per entry. So if you have 100 processes mapping 200 gigs of SGA, then each process will need 52 million pages, which is 800 megabytes of page table entries for 200 gig of SGA. So if you have 100 processes, you're going to have 80 gig of page table entries for 200 gigs of SGA. If you have 1,000 processes, you're going to need 800 gigabytes of memory for page table entries to map out 200 gigabytes of SGA. It's not scalable at all. With huge pages, this drops to 1.6 max because it's 512 times less. So basically, any large system with a significant amount of, S of SGA must use huge pages. And the new memory um, management on, in Oracle, memory target, cannot use huge pages. So this immediately excludes it for me for any serious system. There's also a performance benefit. The CPUs have a limited fixed size page table entries caches, so they don't have to look up these structures. And these caches are typically 500 entries. So if you reduce your number of page table entries required by a factor of 512, then your cache, CPU cache, becomes much more efficient. And at some point, I, I measured on the pure memory CPU bound workload 10 15% improvement. C groups. This is a, a new feature introduced in the Linux kernel, and it's essentially, it's called control groups. And it's a century resource manager for Linux. And it's very, very advanced. I only played it with it a little bit because there's not many installations with um, the new kernel that has this support. But it supports block I.O., it supports CPU, CPU sets, and all kinds of fancy stuff. But what's more important, it also supports memory. And this is pretty big. The memory, the way the C groups work with memory is you can limit by process and you can define your, your, how you map out processes to C groups, how much memory they can use. And this includes file system cache. So for example, if you still, how many of you don't use ASM today for significant size databases? One person. So, oh, three, okay. If you have a backup agent that runs, that uh, if you do not use RMAN to backup your database, or you don't use RMAN to, um, Oracle tools to backup your database and use file system tools, they typically access the data without directly or say, well, they will start loading a lot of stuff into the file system cache. You can use C groups to limit that. Um, it's more useful on non database servers than others because on database servers, typically, you're supposed to run huge pages, which is locked in memory, direct the yo, which just bypasses the file system cache. But it's still very useful because in order to control memory, you need to measure it. For example, right now, if you want to find out how much memory is used by Oracle, it's very difficult. It's almost impossible to do so. But if you use C groups and you've assigned Oracle processes to the C groups, you can very easily do that. And it also measures the file system cache, measures the swap, and if you enable the feature, it, it can measure certain kernel memory and account for it. You can also, if you run multiple databases, currently in 11.2, there is no way to limit how much memory they can use. So if, I, if you have multi-tenants in, um, in, in a single system, and one rogue database can have a PSQL package that goes insane and starts allocating memory and allocating and allocating, and you can consume 20, 30 gigs of RAM, no problem. With C groups, you can assign each database to a different group. And there's also soft limits. There are soft limits that you can assign for, for fair distribution of memory. So it's pretty cool. 
I haven't played with this too much, but it's very exciting. Now, the interesting part is that from, for memory reporting is that um, usage is reported. And there's also notifiers functionality. So there's low, medium, and critical. So all of these three memory monitors you can, are generally complete garbage because you saw in that, in that example that if I just start reading files, suddenly I have a low memory situation and you, someone will get paged. And that's not necessarily a problem. C groups can have notifiers per group, and you can have conditions such as low, medium, and critical, with low being um, some memories being shifted around, medium being some memories being sent to disk, and critical being I'm really having hard times finding memory. And this is all described in the manual. So it's pretty cool. I play with this a little bit. Um, so it's in the documentation how to set it up. It's super easy, basically three commands. You mount, it's weird, you mount the memory management into a file system in PROC. But whatever, you mount it, and then you can create, you can create a C group by creating a virtual directory in PROC. Once you create it, inside it magic, magic files appear that you can cat to read from for, to get a status, and you can write to to set controls. One of the things you can do is you can disable the out of memory killer for a particular group. It's pretty cool. So what I did is I, f I fired up, I created a C group zero because that's, that was what in the example, you can probably, you should probably call it Oracle one or Oracle underscore Sid, something like that. And then I took door door for my bash session that starts up the database and put it into tasks. This is how you can send a process to a specific C, C group. And then I started the database. And then I ran this little script which basically every second cats the file usage in bytes. So it's very raw how, how the next few slides are shown. But I had them in two different sessions and I executed certain commands and it was kind of fun. So here, here's an interesting example. So the database is started. It had a memory target of one gig. No huge pages, no nothing. So when I started it, it immediately consumed 860 megs according to this accounting. And then I created a table space and now it consumed 1.8. What? <laughs> I created a table space and suddenly I double my memory target? So then I went ahead and shut down the database and now I'm consuming a gig. Can you guess what this is? It's caching. The caching, because the, by default, the databases don't have direct AO enabled. So when I drop the table space, the memory goes away. So then I set up, you know, um, direct AO, file system AO, option set all, an absolutely mandatory parameter on any serious system. Now when I create a table space, it doesn't take memory, which is the way it's supposed to be. Then I created a table and started loading it with data. And as I run this insert append, it doesn't consume any memory because it's direct path. Basically, Oracle reads from the file, writes to the file, caches nothing. Then I increase my memory target to have more fun because my table happened to be two gigs. And then I start up the database and instantly 2.5 gigs are u utilized with memory target. And this, is, this was weird, I wonder why it was doing this. I think it has to do with the way memory is touched and managed. So then I restarted the database, I removed memory target, used the SGA target. Still no huge pages, but they use the SGA target. Now when I start up the database, it uses 622, the second number. Now what is the first number? The first number is the same memory used, but for the root control group, basically the, the very first con control group which you cannot have any limits, by the way. Only um, first level down control groups can have limits. So I, why did I show both numbers? It's because I wanted to see if memory is accounted inside the root control group when memory is used inside a, a, the a control group that I created. So then I did a count star on the table, and I wanted this table to be fully cached, so I had to disable the serial direct read. So when I read this table, 
Um, you can see the table was 250 gigabytes. You can see that it gets cached and memory gets initialized right here. And the root memory doesn't, the root control group doesn't change. So you can use control groups to effectively track memory usage for your Oracle systems. Now to monitor from within memory, from within Oracle, the, the SGA is very easy. It's fixed and that's it. But the PGA, the, sorry, the, the PGA is very difficult. Um, you can use video or process to do so, but it's what Oracle thinks it's using and sometimes they don't match. The only true number is what you get from the OS perspective of what memory is being utilized. But this is what you can use to detect leaks. So if video or process or video or process memory doesn't match what the OS is reporting for the same PID, then you, you probably have a memory leak. Now, if you don't have a memory leak, you can use these views to try to determine if it's pure SQL memory, other memory, work area, etc. So you can do some mapping out. There is another view, video or process memory detail, which is not populated and requires to set some kind of an event PGA detail get. I haven't used it, haven't tested it. I haven't had to troubleshoot this. And thank you, that's it. Questions? There, uh, there were no, there is no reason to have a 60% rule, 40% rule, 10% rule, 80% rule. You set it what it needs to be set. But what it needs to be set can be difficult to figure out. And it changes dramatically with the size. So when you have 8 gigs of RAM, 60% makes sense because about 3 gig for the OS, for the clusterware, for the all the little demons that need to run, etc. But when you have 500 gigs of RAM, 60%, that means about 200 gigs remain free for the same functionality. That's overkill. So the rule in percentages is not sufficient. It's no, it's different than swapping. Yeah, the rules, the rules that are done are if you have no idea what you're doing. And you can see how um, without huge pages, 60% kind of makes sense because you need the other memory to manage the PTEs, the page table entries. But with huge pages, there is no restrictions. You can go as far as, as, as big as you want. Just remember that the only memory that will go into huge pages is the SGAs. So if you have a lot of connections, if you have a lot of sorting, a lot of that, it cannot use that memory. So you have to decide ahead of time how much memory to give to the SGA for all your databases. Now you can start databases without putting them in the huge pages if it's temporary, but you can do that. So no 60% rule, no 70% rule, whatever makes sense. Just be careful that if you don't, you know, don't make your system swapping. A database server should never swap. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the role of uh, dev, SHM, and is that still required uh, using huge pages? No. Just whatever the default is. Don't look at it. Completely ignore it. Okay. Huge pages off. You need dev, SHM, even greater than. Uh, I don't think it matters what you set it at. There may be a, some kind of a logical limit, but performance-wise makes no difference. If it works, it works. It doesn't matter, but you shouldn't be running serious databases without huge pages. Ever. You can use SGA target. I don't like it because of all kinds of issues related to trying to constantly adjust and having an unpredictable system. I prefer static for everything and I recommend static for everything, for anything that's large enough. The only time you would use automatic is whenever it's insignificant in size. So basically, if you have, if you have four gigs of SGA and that's what you can assign for a database, 
you're going to have a hard time deciding, should I give the shared pool one gig or half a gig? What if I need more? How much should be my large pool? And etc. But when you have 250 gigs of SGA, you just say, okay, shared pool, four gigs, done, right? It's, and it, it's a percentage of your cash size, and etc. And if you have rack, it needs to be larger, and etc. But once you have hundreds of gigabytes of, of memory, you just set fixed limits and you're done. You can, whether you use SGA target or not, you can still dynamically adjust the values. But the moment you use SGA target, then Oracle will be more aggressive in adjusting these. You can still change them. So even if you don't set SGA target, don't set SGA max size, just set your individual ones. Then by default, SGA max size is the sum of all your uh, pools. And you can still dynamically adjust them, but you have to lower one and raise another. And you can do so without using automatic memory at all. So you don't lose that functionality by manually setting your, your memory stuff. So if you don't have a 32K um, or uh, if you don't have a keep cache, you can lower your regular cache and initialize a keep cache online even with static settings. Any other questions? Last call. All right, thank you.